This week on To the Contrary, a revolution or quiet acceptance? What's next for the majority of Americans who support Roe versus Wade after a draft Supreme Court opinion ends federal support for abortion rights? I'm Bonnie Herbe. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. Up first, a final decision could be months away. But abortion rights advocates aren't waiting. They are mobilizing after having seen the leaked first draft of a majority opinion in the historic Dobbs case from Mississippi. The draft shows the court overturning Roe v. Wade which has protected women's rights to an abortion for almost 50 years. That sets the stage for 13 states to ban abortion immediately through so-called trigger laws. Experts predict abortion will be banned or severely limited by 25 or 26 states quickly after the final opinion is issued. President Biden is urging Congress to pass a law making abortion legal at the federal level. And there has been a social media explosion excoriating Republican Maine Senator Susan Collins, who voted to confirm both Justices Corsuch and Kavanaugh to the court. They essentially prevaricated before the Senate during their confirmation hearings, saying Roe v. Wade was established legal precedent and they would vote to uphold it. So while anti-abortion groups are celebrating, pro-choice organizations are taking to the streets and developing strategies on how to move forward. And I'm speaking now with Alexis McGill, the president of Planned Parenthood. Welcome to the show. What do pro-choice factions have to do now moving forward? So the way forward, um, you know, we have an uh, immediate next step with our Senate uh, taking up the Women's Health Protection Act again to uh, demonstrate um, and hold to account um, the fact that uh, the Senate has legislation to codify Roe, um, and we will be looking to see Again, who is supporting the legislation? The second thing we have to do is capture the rage. Um, As you have seen, people are out in the streets. They are out at the courts, the federal buildings, um, uh, upset because the majority of people believe that abortion should be uh, the law of the land. Uh, Access to abortion should be the the law of the land. Um, They believe that they should be able to make the decisions, not politicians. And um, and they are fired up and they are are looking to be engaged. When I was coming of age politically in the 70s and 80s, abortion was a an issue that women voted on. It was at the top of the list. And since the 80, since the 90s or so, it's been, you know, the economy, jobs, uh, whatever else, international security, if there's a war anything but abortion. Is this going to change that? I'm 49. I'm as old as Roe. And I I think about that all the time because my generation was the first generation to really grow up with this right um, in hand. And a lot of what we've had to do over the last couple of months uh, since the oral arguments, when it became clear uh, where the court was going to take this case um, is, 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 sound the alarm bell, you know, the sky is falling, it's happening. And what we what we learned in our own research was that while a majority of people support access to uh, abortion, support Roe as being the law of land, uh, only 30% of people actually believed it could fall. And this is like nine months into uh, SB8 in Texas, the horrific six week unconstitutional ban uh, that, uh, that it has a, a bounty hunting provision uh, attached to it. Um, so what I believe is that this court um, with this draft opinion has in fact closed that believability gap. People now understand the existential threat that accessing healthcare in their own state um, is going to have. We have seen over 600 restrictions introduced since the beginning of this year in state legislative sessions in 42 states. Uh, Samuel Alito said in the opinion 
that this would not apply. So he went out of his way to say, this is only about abortion because it concerns a fetus. It won't apply to contraception or gay rights. And should women and, you know, and diverse people be worried that their rights are, are next? You know, here's the here's the playbook, right? We have uh, seen uh, the entire judiciary remade over the last 12 years. We have seen state legislatures be gerrymandered um, into a spaces where uh, where they are completely out of uh, touch and and uh, with their own constituents on so many of these issues. And when you see the number of trans bills that are in the same states where there are abortion restrictions and voting restrictions, that tells me that is a fight they want to have. Um, so I am concerned very much that um, that all of the issues that we've been fighting about, ones that we care immensely about, are very much under attack. Other groups such as LGBTQ plus worry rights such as marriage equality could be among the arch conservative justices next targets along with access to contraception. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Of course. Happy to make time. Joining me today are DC Democratic Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton, former Republican Representative Dan Hayworth from New York, Democratic strategist Hillary Rosen, and Republican political strategist Rena Shaw. So Eleanor Holmes Norton, as a member of the House, is there really anything can co- that Congress can do at this point? Very little, Bonnie. Uh, the House is controlled by Democrats, and we are likely uh, to pass a bill. Uh, but it's hard to get anything through the Senate because of the filibuster. Is there no chance that, uh, I mean, even though... Uh, conservative Republicans are relishing this victory, which has been 50 years in the making for them. Um, there, there still is no um, federal right that's ever been passed by Congress. And it's. I also read somewhere that even if Congress says, okay, we, there's a federal right to abortion and the president signs it, that a Supreme Court decision on the same question prevails. And so congressional action might indeed be useless. It looks pretty useless at this point. The Supreme Court is the final word on such matters. And the Supreme Court has spoken that we can pass a a bill uh, that would try to make uh, abortion legal in the states. Remember, it's still legal in about half the states. That's where we're gonna have to do our work. This is going to become a major campaign issue. Uh, It is gonna rally Democrats in a most extraordinary way. So you will see votes on this issue in the House and in the Senate. Uh, You think that the the Senate Democrats will be able to overcome the filibuster? I think the filibuster will keep them from passing anything, but you will see them on the floor and you will see them trying to get a vote this is going to be an issue that excites the electorate. Uh, and they can't afford to sit on this issue, even though it's lost to us and the Supreme Court is the final word. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. I have gotten very cynical about abortion being an issue on the ballot. I know it was in the 70s and 80s very much so. But women and men seem to have gotten very sort of spoiled by the fact that abortion is available. Nan, I wanted to ask you, do you think it'll be a motivating force in the midterms that people will come out because they're angry with the Supreme Court about this decision if it turns out similar to what the draft said it would be? Well, there are obviously, uh, you know, Bonnie, a lot of uh, conditionals there. Uh, this was, uh, it seems genuinely to have been a, a, a very much a working document. Uh, not at all clear which where uh, every justice will fall. We can certainly make some pretty strong predictions, but there are a couple of uh, uh, justices up in the air. So we really don't know where this is going to land, but if it lands uh, as this, uh, majority draft would indicate, since it's for the majority, 
then it, it could indeed be a, a political issue. I think that's why it was leaked. I think probably, although we do not know, and this must be determined swiftly uh, and acted upon, and this is a, a, a great concern, which may also be motivating uh, for uh, a lot of folks, especially uh, on the right. But um, yeah, this uh, this was an attempt to uh, energize, I think, uh, the uh, the base of the left and of the Democratic Party. And, uh, you know, it, it, it could succeed. But for those of us who quite objectively uh, seek to cherish the uh, the Constitution and to respect it uh, and to understand that, yes, the Constitution can be amended. So the other recourse available in terms of uh, this sort of uh, this sort of right, if you will, uh, would be to pass a constitutional amendment, a uh, laborious process. But if that is where the American public is, then that's uh, then that's how it can come about. Uh, all right. Your thoughts, Hillary. You're you're very active on this issue, we should say. Uh, what are the pro-choice advocates saying the next step? is? Look, I think the strategy is fairly clear, but it's not simple. The, you know, first and foremost, we have to hold the Senate and uh, we meaning Democrats have to hold the Senate. We cannot afford to lose these vulnerable Democrats that are up for election. And we have to, you know, try and get a pickup in one of those vulnerable states where we have a shot like Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. Number two, the organizing shifts to the states. The Congresswoman uh, is exactly right. I believe that you know, passing legislation is, is a non-starter at the federal level. The states are where this is going to be most active because first and foremost, we have to protect women who need, who need these services. And the only way to do that is to support them in the states where this will stay legal. Rena, your thoughts. Well, you know, Bonnie, you said something earlier that really struck a chord with me and that I went to college in the early 2000s. I was uh, very much... Uh, raised up a social conservative in a home that really believed uh, that abortion was wrong. And when I went to a big liberal state school, you know, of course, I was met with situations where I could see both sides. And so, as I've said on this show many times, as, as you once reminded me, the Mario Cuomo answer is always that I'm, I'm anti-abortion for myself, but I'm pro-choice for other women. And, and that came out of seeing things in college that I just, I really couldn't turn a blind eye to. And I went to college in West Virginia, a very, a state that, that of course is, is going to be very restrictive and have immediate effects for West Virginian women if they try to seek abortion services if Roe is overturned. Now, uh, really what you said earlier about people taking for granted, really, access to safe abortions. My generation, and I'm born after 1980, so I'm a millennial, elder millennial, but uh, but I will say, yes, there, there's been a sense that how could it be taken from us, that access to safe abortions, access to reproductive care that lower income women in my home state of West Virginia do receive through certain clinics that do provide abortion services. So this is extremely complex uh, on so many levels. I think we, American women are waking up and realizing, you know, when, when finally it feels like your rights are on the line, maybe it's time to speak up for what your values are. I, I've been asked a lot uh, in the past two days what young or Republican women are going to do, how they're going to act this this fall. I think it's just way too early to tell. We need to acquaint ourselves with the facts as American women. I want to get on to a next uh, question on this. Uh, Eleanor, how um, how is the is it possible that the decision might change before it comes out. This was a draft that actually went out months ago. Um, and of course we see everybody says uh, Chief Justice Roberts is undecided as to which side, of course he wouldn't change the decision, it would still be 5-4, but it's pretty monumental if you have a Chief Justice voting against uh, a, a decision that his party wants or at least the, those, the extremists who control his party right now want. So how likely is it that it'll change and by how much before we see the decision at the end probably of next month? This was a draft uh, decision, Bonnie. So it is true that it could change, but given the majority on the Supreme Court I believe the changes will be in nuances only. I think what you see is what you're going to get. 
Uh, do you think some of that language, especially at the very top of the decision, which is, you know, Roe is over, we're, you know, it's, yeah. it, it's not, a, it was never a decision that should have been handed down, yeah. you know, the, the very yeah. sort of like we're going to war with Roe mm -hmm. right now kind of um, discussion, uh, kind of uh, talk is going to stay or go? And will it matter? Yeah, the, the, the language goes too far. You're overturning a 50-year decision, a decision that the majority of the American people support. This is what I mean by change in the nuances. Uh, to the extent that the minority uh, has any say, I think that they're going to want uh, the court to be far less dogmatic and uh, almost joyful that they are overturning this decision and to be respectful of the division in the in, in, in the country. So I do expect the language to be uh, uh, less bold and, and uh, dogmatic than what we have read in the draft opinion. Nan, do you think, uh, what do you think Justice Robert, Chief Justice Roberts is gonna end up doing? And I wanna note that the Republican Senator Senatorial Campaign Committee the arm of the party that raises most, you know, the most important fundraising arm of the party for Republican Senate candidates, sent a memo out right after the uh, decision was leaked saying, you guys better soft pedal this issue. Even the Republican committee uh, that, that raises money for senators says soft pedal it. What do you think? Well, I think Chief Justice Roberts' first job is to uh, secure the foundation of the court and make sure that uh, this uh, severe uh, breach in, in trust, in confidence, and in the, uh, this is the one institution we count on to be the grown-ups in the room uh, in uh, the the uh, <laughs> in our federal government, uh, you know that that they that they do identify who did this, uh, and does this does this brief show that they're no longer the grown ups in the room? Um, I mean, does this brief yeah. show that they they're just yeah. vote? They're not only vo voting along party lines to a fare thee well, especially if they get Chief Justice Roberts, but they're they're also Voting the, the decision was written in a way as to say to evangelical Christians who elected Donald Trump, we are we will support you to the nth degree, to the most extreme degree that we I can. would I agree with Congresswoman Holmes Norton that I think the language would be significantly moderated. Uh, I do think that this uh, needs to be done very thoughtfully. Uh, and it is truly an issue that uh, perhaps of any we face uh, needs to be uh, looked at as, as Rena said, you know, with the, the greatest amount of compassion and respect. Uh, I, I do, uh, as I say, I see the court's first, the just, Chief Justice's first responsibility to be to secure the court to ensure that what is supposed to remain within its walls remains within its walls, because this isn't the only dramatic decision uh, with which they are faced. Okay, let me jump over because we're uh, running out of time. Hillary, what rights are they going to do away with next? Well, I, look, I think that, you know, no matter what they do to this language, if the impact is the same, if the impact is that they've taken away this right uh, for a woman to make this private decision if they've taken this away, then, you know, all of the rights that have depended on a, a right to privacy in the Constitution are threatened. You know, we've heard this before. It's not just LGBT uh, rights, but it's also right to sexual privacy and other things we've seen in other decisions, et cetera. And so I, I think you can't put lipstick on this pig. You can't take out the first nasty paragraph of Samuel Alito and then say that the rest of the decision is more moderate. What we have to assess is the impact. And I think for as a, from a political perspective, look, de Democrats have been crying, let's 
face it, wolf over this issue for 30 years in election campaigns and saying that um, fundamental rights are threatened at the Supreme Court, fundamental rights are threatened, and the public didn't buy it. They continued to elect on a bipartisan basis members that did not agree with the, them on this issue. And so I think now that you've actually, they've actually, you know, doing this, it is much more, it's a different environment that we are experiencing. And Democrats this year, which have been a kind of circular firing squad on our each other, I think all of a sudden this firepower is going to be turned on the Republicans, particularly because the Republicans bought into the lies of Brett Kavanaugh and the sham and, and Neil Gorsuch and the sham that they insisted on in these Supreme Court hearings in the Senate. What we have here is is a um, uh, an American problem, an American cultural movement that is feeling completely threatened by this sort of setback. And I think that that will be um, a huge backlash uh, against against government, against you know the 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 f five white men who think this is their decision to make. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh both told the Senate. Judiciary Committee that they were um, they supported the pre legal precedent and they would vote to support it. And clearly, with this decision, I mean, assuming it, the vote comes out the way it was in the draft, um, they are not telling. They didn't tell the truth. Should there be consequences? for Supreme Court justices who don't tell the truth in their um, in their confirmation hearings. Yes. I mean, we, we prosecute people for lying to the FBI. We prosecute people for lying to political bodies. The idea that we are in this situation, that Susan Collins is, you know, now saying, I can't believe I was lied to, is horrifying, I think. And yes, consequences are appropriate. You'd have to hold uh, every justice to that same standard. There was plenty of uh, dissembling or diversion uh, among uh, the uh, ju justices to the left as well. They they avoided certain questions. Of course, of course. If you if you put it if you if it were possible to make a law like that, that right. a, a constitutional I mean, amendment, I suppose, that would not make Supreme Court justices lifetime appoint appointees and subject to, you know, having their terms ended if it ter if they lied uh, on the, you know, lied to Congress, that is a crime, um, then it would have to be for both parties. Yes. Obviously. And I just think that would be a very, very difficult uh, standard to uphold, given that every Supreme Court decision has uh, particular nuances related to the case. Listen, we should them. not pretend any longer that the Supreme Court is a neutral body. And I think the American people decided that a while ago, maybe even after Bush v. Gore, they decided that the Supreme Court is as political a body as Congress or the White House. And I just think, let's stop pretending that it is. And if Justice Roberts really wanted to do something about that, then he would figure out how to make this a different outcome. The most politically vocal justice is really Justice Sotomayor, who's very much on the left. So this is, I certainly, these are human beings and uh, yes, they, they have, uh, they, they're nominated uh, for a reason, obviously by their respective presidents, but I don't think this is uh, somehow a disease of the right, to say the least. And Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, as a Yale Law School graduate, as a professor of constitutional law, I think it's constitutional law at Georgetown University, my uh, alma mater, uh, do you think there's a way, a viable way to hold justices responsible for the statements they make during the uh during the confirmation Absolutely process. not, Bonnie. They call it Supreme Court for a reason. They are supreme. There's no, there's, there's nobody above them. Indeed, we've not even been able to get the Supreme Court to issue their own set of ethics, even though we have ethics for all the other courts. So they they have all but been above the law, and they certainly are not going to be able. And we're certainly not going to be able to do anything uh, about what they've done in this decision. Do you believe that the court has become so politicized 
that America is losing faith in it as a neutral I do believe it's become, uh, uh, except for the chief judge, he's the only, uh, <laughs> he's the he's the only justice that that keeps the court from being entirely politicized. Well, we've had a lot of evidence in in recent years, particularly that show Americans are rapidly losing faith in all of our institutions across the board. Uh, You know, it's no surprise that the Supreme Court has kicked so much to the states and Congress has sat idly by and abdicated their duty to really be a check on one of the branches of government uh, that really so so needs it as much as any of the other two. I say this about what we've learned from the Supreme Court this week and particularly around this decision. Uh, You know, let's look through everything. Let's look at everything through the pro-democracy lens from now on. Let's look at each other as equals in this society. And I I really am nervous about the court moving forward, but I trust that there will be people who meet the moment. All right. That's it for this edition. Thank you very much for joining us. Please keep the conversation going. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please go to our PBS website, which is pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Park Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more PBS.